Welcome to Chris's Storytelling Corner. My name is Christopher Moldong and I am an author. Today I will do manga reviews for Nagima Volumes 29 to 32. Next week I will review volumes 33 to 35. Also check out my reading of The Orthodox Clash pages 1 to 4. You can check out my author's website at www.chrismoldong.com. You can buy my first novel, a fantasy adventure called The Mustard Prince in the Condiment Kingdom for $4.99. Also, for $2.99, you can buy my short story collection, which is a collection of 10 short stories in the horror, fantasy, and realistic fiction genres. Uh, check out my Twitter page and author's Facebook, Facebook page. Links to all these will be provided on the description. Don't forget to subscribe, share, and comment to this channel if you're on YouTube, or follow, share, and comment on this channel if you're listening to this on SoundCloud. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher, please rate, review, and share this channel. So, the way this works is I will do a detailed recap of uh, volumes 29 to uh, 32 uh, after the recap of... Uh, single volume I will give my personal thoughts on these um, some of these volumes I want to say it's like volume it's like th maybe 31 30 or 31 they're pretty long there's a lot that goes on so um, let's get started with volume 29 uh, the volume begins with rock on facing off with fate Rockin calls him Avaruncus of Earth and mentions that Nagi defeated the first and second one of uh, you guys, which is like fate, and that fate is the third. Fate tells Rock on that uh, our way will save the greatest number of weak souls. Fate's girls appear and try to fight against Rock on, but he uses skirt flipping techniques to stop them. The girls get serious, changing their forms, and Rock on defeats them uh, easily. He then asks why they are helping fate, and they show a flashback of fate uh, rescuing one of the girls who became an orphan. Fate uh, tells him that he took uh, uh, other 57 orphans he took uh, to school and uh, Fate and Rakan then fight each other. Back at the ball, Negi, who as Nagi, dances with Asuna and Kotaro as Kojiro dances with Natsumi. Craig from the Treasure Hunters asks uh, Nago Nodoka to dance uh, him and the other treasure hunters were invited to the ball. Tosaka and the chief are a part of the ball staff as hired help. Uh, Takane, Mei, Misora, and Kokone are also at the ball. Uh, Godel watches on in secret from a balcony. Uh, Haruna tells Nagi and Kojiro that Godel will be late and that they should use this time to make Pactio cards. Nagi asks Kufei to make a Pactio with him. She says that they have to fight each other. They then have an arm wrestling match. Nagi wins and they kiss and make a Pactio. Kufei reveals her artifact. Uh, Jin, I can't pronounce this. Shin Zente uh, Zaize gun, which is a gun staff. She tells him that he has to be her future husband. And a flashback. Uh, Chachimaru asks Evangeline if she has a soul. In the present, Chachimaru talks to Natsume about love and making a patio. Uh, Kojiro uh, finds Natsume and tells her that Haruna suggested to make a patio with her. Natsume runs away. Uh, Negi approaches Chachimaru and says that he'll wind her up. Uh, Natsume continues to run away from Kojiro and he chases after her. Catches up to her and he turns back to his normal size. Uh, as Kotaro. So Kotaro tells her that he likes Natsumi and that she's the most important person there is to him. He says that he wants to protect her and that he has to make a pact deal with her. So they kiss, make a pact deal. Afterwards, Natsumi tells Kotaro that she likes him too and runs away. He didn't seem to hear her though. Elsewhere, Nagi is winding up Chachamaru. Chachamaru cries over the fact that she may not have a soul. So they tried to make a pact deal. And after a really long kiss, they successfully make one. It's back at Mahora Academy. Evangeline heads to Al's place, but runs into Aishun. Uh, 
uh, Aishun tells her that he got an invitation from Al. They, uh, uh, they end up uh, with uh, Al, and he tells them that he might share a bit of information. Uh, he says that Negi might be arriving at the secrets of the other world by about now. Nagi receives a message that Godel is waiting for him in a deluxe suite. He is allowed to bring three companions with him, so he brings Chisame, Asakura, and Nadoka with him. Through the door to the suite, they meet Godel. However, the background around him shows Negi's village from six years ago. Uh, Godel reveals that the true villains are the Megalomesembria Senate, which he is a part of. They were responsible for Negi's village getting burned to the ground. Negi then attacks Godel and seemingly is using uh, Magia Arabia. His body is covered in runes. So as Negi gets more consumed by the darkness, the girls manage to stop him. And Asakura asks Godel what he's after. He tells him that he wants Negi to join him. Uh, Godel ex uh, explains that the Megalosembria Senate, the mage of the beginning, Fate Averuncus, and his companions, and the uh, Hellas Empire, are their enemies. He wants Negi to defeat every one of them. He says that they will save all 67 million humans from this dying world. Nadoka asks Godel if everything he said was true. After his response, Nadoka confirms that it's all true, because she has the artifact, and that he had nothing to do with what happened to Negi's village. Using a projection device that uses an illusion space, he shows his interpretation of the tale of Nagi's father and mother. Nagi defeats the maid at the beginning. Afterwards, he's alone with Princess Erika back in like the city. She hugs him from behind and says, A little longer. Will you stay by my side just a little longer? After, humorous, after a humorous comment from Nagi, sh she tells him that uh, he had best forget about it. She says she will continue to live her life alone and reveals that she is no longer a princess but queen of the kingdom. She tells him the likes of him cannot act so familiar with her. Nagi tells her that if you want me to, I'll take you anywhere, even to the end of the world. She then attacks him and thinks that he's joking. Nagi says that she's hiding something. So they go to 23 hours earlier, ships around. Uh, they have all these ships surrounding the that giant ball of light that's going to, like I guess, destroy the world. Um, Princess Arika orders to suppress it, and Goto asks, are you sure? Uh, back with Nagi, Zekt tells him that a war hero cannot build a future. Humans are past help. Hero, feel our despair of 20, 2,600 years. Goodbye. Zekt vanishes as Nagi looks on yelling, Master. So, yeah, Zekt, um, yeah, we don't really know where he came from, actually. So, they got to 18 hours later, I guess we're at, like after like the celebration and beating the mage at the beginning. So Nagi, Aishun, and Rakan receive a hero celebration. They then have drinks at a bar. Alberio tells them that Arika's father was a puppet of Cosmo and Uh Arika took the throne in something like a half coup d'etat. Nagi reveals that he told Arika that he'd take her on a date to Aishun's hometown in Kyoto with Himeko-chan. Uh, another flashback shows Nagi promising uh, to him promising her to take her on that date. Gato and Godel appear, and Gato tells Ariko that the first stage of the fall is about to begin. Also, Princess Asuna uh, started hitting the entire fleet with all their power, leaving them at 37% ca capacity. They brought all the citizenry to this remote island in the name of holding the ceremony. At the end of the volume, Arika says that she will take direct command as it looks like the floating islands are falling. So some thoughts on volume 29. Um, so is Zach, you know, like, who is this guy? <laughs> He's this, like, boy that's a part of the group that Nagi calls Master. Uh, we don't know anything about his past. We don't really know what his powers are. If he's a part of that group, though, a la Ruba, um, he's got to be really strong. Uh, and it seems like he was. We actually don't even know why Nagi calls him master. 
she had a lot of Arika. She's a real strong character. She seems to be super serious. Somewhat oblivious, though. Like, you know, it's like... Nagi likes her, you know? Uh, I mean, Nagi and Arika seem to love each other, actually. But they have this weird, like, one step forward, two steps back thing going on. As far as the progress of the relationship, it's like she does something, oh, she hugs him, wants to be with him, then says, oh, no, I can't be with you. And Nagi's just like, I'll take you anywhere. And it's like, no, you're joking. And it's like, okay, one step forward, two steps back, I, like, type thing. Uh, you know, back with Nagi, they, he was, they had the ball, which was interesting, and then a lot of things just kind of happened. You know, you have all the pack deal cards being made. And then there's Nagi's meeting with Kurt. Um, it was pretty busy. It, it, it was kind of like what I, the ball was what I expected, you know, that a lot of like situations happened where some form of progress would happen and we'd find some answers and whatnot. Uh, Kurt Godell, you know, he seems like a villain. Um, we don't really know what his reasons are for doing what he's doing, but, um, I guess we'll find out, really. And then, you know, you had Fate versus Rock On, which is a neat battle. You know, Rock On is pretty in invincible. Uh, Fate is also really strong, too. He can turn guys to stone. Uh, um, he has all this, like, different, like, looks like magical ability. Um, and, like, a lot of stone ability, too. And Rock On just has the swords and just the super strength and the guts. So, we'll, <laughs> excuse me, we'll see how, how that fight turns out. Again, volume 30, the volume starts with uh, destruction and the capital about to be destroyed. Arika is ordering her people to save every citizen. Nagi tries to speak to her through a monitor. Arika tells him that she has sacrificed her kingdom in order to save the world. He said he's coming to her, but she tells him to take care of the falling rocks. So... Asha falls and disappears from the map. Queen Arika uh, apparently sealed away the anti-magic field created by the Imperial Princess of Twilight, Asuna, along with the princess herself. 50 kilometers around the capital, magic could not be used for 20 years. It left millions of refugees. Uh, Megalomasembrian troops took control of the kingdom. Two months later in Megalomasembria, at a Senate meeting, Rika tries to fight for her people. They arrest her on the charges of the murder of her father, collaborating with Cosmo and Telekia, and suspected of being an imposter. Queen Arika was sentenced uh, for two years in prison at the Cerberus Eternal Prison, then death. She was then known as the Queen of Calamity. So, you jump to two years later, the Senator visits Arika in prison. He asks how to reach the innermost depths of the graveyard that was sealed along with the Imperial Princess of Twilight, but Arika does not say anything. He says her sentence will be carried out in 10 days. Elsewhere, Ala Rubra gets a message from Kurt that Queen Arika will be executed in 10 days. Despite Kurt begging Nagi to save her, Nagi seems hesitant. Uh, at the day of the execution, Arika gets forced into the Cerberus Ravine is a den of monsters where magic isn't usable at the bottom. Excuse me. A person in armor then makes a scene uh, and he turns out to be Jack Rockon. Uh, Alberio, Aishun, and Gato join him. At the bottom of the ravine, Nagi saves Arika and the rest of Ala Rubra, they're kind of like above, uh, fight against the guards. They make it uh, Rika and Nagi make it above the ravine and are flying on top of Nagi's staff. Rika asks Nagi why he saved her and he admits that he loves her. Rika tells him that these last two years, not a day went by that she didn't think about him. They kiss and Nagi asks if she wants to marry him. She says yes. Um, Kurt, like a young Kurt, gets angry that this won't restore Rika Sama's honor or fix anything. Takamichi says them, um, let's just call today a happy ending. So in the present, Kurt cries at that last, you know, watching that last scene. Nadoka, using her artifact, asks if he is in love with Arika. She finds out that Kurt did love Arika. 
Kurt asks Negi to fight alongside him. Using the spy gongs, the other girls that are not in the room watch the video that Kurt uh, presented. Yue and her new friends appear and watch the video with them. Um, Yue then uh, tells them that Negi has a very rare potential being a member of the royal bloodline, which starts with the creator god. They are capable of magic from the age of the gods. Uh, Haruna and Katara are surprised that uh, the one that Nagi called Himiko-chan is named Princess Asuna. That's the same name as Asuna, or the Asuna they know. Um, Sayo appears and recaps what happened with Negi and Godel. Elsewhere, Rockon fights against Fate. He gets a better Fate. Fate tells him that he can never defeat him. Fate gets a staff that's in the shape of a large key and has like a globe uh, on it too. Uh, Rockon destroys the staff and lands a finishing blow on Fate. And then Rockon then suddenly ends up in a field. Fate is fully dressed, sitting in a gazebo, drinking coffee. He tells Rockon that this place is not an illusion and this entire world has always been an illusion. Rockon gets behind Fate, but all, all of a sudden he is sitting on a chair, fully dressed, uh, drinking coffee. So they're all like in their formal like uh, attire. Fate then tells Rockon the magic of the beginning and end of the world rewrite. Uh, puppets cannot oppose the puppet master. That is the code of the life maker. Uh, back with Negi, he tells Godel that he will join him. In exchange, he wants Godel to promise that he won't lay a hand on his party and that he wants to take them off the wanted list. Godel wants him to sign a contract. So before Negi signs a contract, he wants to ask a basic question and then uh, inquires about uh, Godel's real goal. Negi mentions to Godel that Mundus Magicus, the artificial world built on Mars, is in danger of destruction. Godel is surprised that Nagi knows this, or Negi knows this. Negi reveals that he came to the conclusion by talking with one of Chao Ling Shin's collaborators, Chachamaru. Uh, Negi reveals that he hasn't even asked his question yet. He just kind of inquired about his real goal. His question to Godel is, why didn't he say that he would save everyone? He reveals that the 67 million that Goodell wants to save is only the population of Megalomysembria and that the world has a po total population of 1 2 point billion if you include the demi-humans. Negi tells him that his father would save them all. The boy, uh, Kurt's younger self that they saw in the movie wouldn't talk like this and that Arika would be sad to see him like this. Back with Rockon, he uses another artifact that makes him armored. Uh, we're back with Godel. He gets ready to fight against Negi. Uh, the other girls and Kotaro are informed that talks between the two have fallen apart. Uh, Kufei is assigned to get Negi. However, someone tells them, some unknown person, just tells them that the Governor General is an old friend and that that person will go with them. Negi and Godel fight against each other, and Negi gets the better of him. However, the Magia Arabia overtakes Negi. Chisame, with the help of her sprites, breaks the illusion's face. And then a massive sized version of Kufei's staff strikes uh, Godel. Uh, that staff is supposed to be like a replica of like uh, the Monkey King. Um, Son Goku staff, pretty much. Uh, so, and then a beam of ender energy strikes Godel, and it's revealed that it came from Takamichi. Takamichi tells him to go while he handles things. Nadoka, using her artifact, asks Godel a question regarding the last secret of this world. Guards then try to apprehend the girls, but the great Parusama appears, and Sayo shoots them with a Sagita Magica minigun. Uh, Setsuna and Kaede fight against the guards, and Setsuna reveals her new artifact, a sword called uh, Takemi Kazuchi. So this humongous monster gets summoned and tries to grab hold of the great Parusama. Uh, Kaede puts the girls in her cloak and gets them all aboard. One of Fate's men appears, like he's this cloaked figured guy. So does a bunch of skeleton warriors. Haruna then calls for plan B and head for rendezvous, rendezvous point number two. She'll pick them up there. I, she's telling that to like Negi, pretty much, and like his group. 
Uh, demons appear at the ball. Yui explains that they weren't summoned. They were weaved together by using darkness magic. Also, the giant monster attacking them was used by the enemy 20 years ago. Uh, Takane, Mei, Misora, and Kakone appear and help out. Asuna attacks a demon with her sword, but it has no effect, despite the fact that, like, she has the evil destroying sword. So, um, uh, the demon then hurts uh, Asuna. Uh, a woman with a gun appears and shoots it, and the woman turns out to be Mana. Mana explains that Rakan hired her to guard Asuna. Mana tells uh, Asuna to run, but Asuna wants to stay to help, but Mana doesn't want to. She wasn't hired to do that. So Asuna hires Mana. Mana then shoots down the demons. Chisame, who is with Nadoka, Asakura, Negi, and Kufe, tells them that she received a message from Haruna to go with Plan B. The new rendezvous point is in the import dock on the lower levels of the floating island. The ground underneath them collapses, and Nadoka, Asakura, and Sayo get separated from Negi. Craig-san from the Treasure Hunters saved them. Nadoka, Craig, and the group head to the rendezvous point, but one, the cloaked man, that's one of Fate's men, has one of those key staffs and is in their way. So at the end of the volume, the man uses rewrite and Craig disappears. So, some thoughts on volume 30. Uh, the Nagi and Arika stuff is really cute. Uh, I'm glad that they admitted their love for each other. Nagi came off like the hero, and they have this really strange class of, or clash of personalities, you know. Nagi is kind of si silly, doesn't really take things too seriously, and Arika is absolutely serious. Like, she doesn't seem to even know how to have fun, really. Uh, they introduced the attack, I guess, called Rewrite. It is pretty much like using a cheat code. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it, it's like... Anyone from the magical world just cannot do anything about it, <laughs> and, and it, it's just so it's it's kind of unfair. They can't even hurt the the uh, some of these people, and like once you know rewrite is used on these people in the magical world, they just like vanish. You know, I guess humans can fight against it though. Uh, I was I was liking Fate versus Rock on, you know, it was cool, but then like. You know, fate has the power of rewrite, so it just became like absolutely one-sided. Um, it's it's interesting though that Rockon had that armor but didn't use it in his match against Negi. I also felt that Negi really outsmarted Godel with the question thing. That was really cool. Uh, Godel also seems to get hurt quite a bit. <laughs> uh, I like the escape. That was really cool. I mean, this is a really like massive scale escape chaos is just happening all around Negi and uh, his group and like I guess they're a la Alba uh, it looks like they're all temporarily separated uh, the world is in a lot of danger right now and Negi and his group look to be integral to saving the world uh, we'll see how he goes about it really so on to volume 31. The volume begins with one of Fate's men using rewrite on Nadoka's treasure hunter friend, so the cloaked man. Elsewhere, Katara and Natsumi run to the rendezvous point. They run into the chief and she goes with them. Kaede reaches the rendezvous point at the import dock. Ako, Make, Yuna, and Akira, uh, Akira were with her in her cloth and then they get out of it. They run into Tosaka and his employees. Tosaka talks to Akko, and he sees a demon flying behind her. Also, a demon with a key staff uses rewrite on the Megalomasembria soldiers. Another demon shoots Yue, uh, but blasts, the blast shoots through her and hits the class rep uh, with rewrite, and the class rep vanishes. Tosaka pushes Akko away, out of the way, and gets shot with rewrite. He vanishes. Uh, the chief also got shot with uh, rewrite as well. Uh, Chisame apparently has Nadoka's artifact right now, the book. N Negi reads The Secret of the World by, uh, as told by Kurt Godel. They, see, they then see Rakan crashing out of an illusion space fighting fate. 
Rockon still fights him, even though fate tells him that he cannot win. Rockon looks like he's getting the better of fate, but then Rockon ends up disappearing while fate appears standing and unscathed. Negi uses Magia Arabia and tries to fight fate, but Rockon's fist punches Negi, even though he vanished, and his voice tells him to stop fighting. So he's gonna like fight. It's like beyond the grave in a sense. <laughs> Uh, Rockon appears through the use of guts and tells Negi to take care of Osuna and that if they have the power of the life maker, then they may have the real Osuna. He tells Chisame to keep an eye out for Negi on Negi. Uh, Rockon then tells Negi that the Asuna with him right now is probably a fake and then he disappears. Uh, back with Nadoka, Fate's like henchman, the, the cloak guy, tells Nodoka that she will not die here, but will be sent to the eternal garden with those that just disappeared. Nodoka uses her artifact and asks for the man's name. She finds out that his name is Dynamis. In the flashback, Nodoka asks her treasure hunting friends to teach her magic so that she can use magic to enhance her physical attributes. That's what Negi does, pretty much. Nadoka then takes Dynamis' key staff and tells them that she will begin her counterattack. Using her artifact, she asks Dynamis how the wand works and how to use it, and she uses the wand to defend an attack from him. She then asks him how to get out of this situation, so using the wand, Nadoka makes herself and Asakura relocate. They both appear where Kaede and her group is. Dynamis follows them and grabs Nadoka by the head. He burns her artifact book and tells Kaede that he'll send Nadoka's soul to the Eternal Garden, Cosmo and Telakia. Setsuna appears and cuts off Dynamis' arm that's holding Nadoka. Setsuna then gets out uh, Takemi Kazuchi, the God of Swords, and Dynamis then retreats. Um, so they, you know, they all see this like destruction around them and like their friends disappearing. So Natsumi just wants to go home. She's getting, she's crying, she's getting to, like, she doesn't want to be there. Nadoka tells everyone that there's a way to bring everyone back who disappeared. They need to get the great Grand Master key to the world. Elsewhere, Yui and Beatrix are angry about class rep, rep disappearing and fight against the demons. Uh, Beatrix's magic seems to work against them. Mana then helps them out. And then Mana tells Yui that telepathy isn't jammed anymore, and she has a message from her best friend, uh, which is, there's a way to bring them back, don't give up if someone is erased. Yui then seemingly remembers, like, gets her memory back, and pretty much her memories of, like, Nadoka. Uh, Mana tells everyone that they're leaving and that the ball guests have been evacuated. She asks Yue and Beatrix to help her make a path. Also, the great Parusama is being chased by demons. They're shown a video of the Hellas Empire guardian beast, that like giant dragon, fighting the, humong the humongous monster. Uh, they then get in the middle of the battle. The dragon gets hit by the monster and disappears, so he gets rewritten too. Uh, Princess Theodora tries to help with her shifts, but they don't have any effect on these demons. So Chachamaru appears and uses her artifact, Chao Bao Z's satellite support system 2130, Flying Cat Al Iskandaria, which is a satellite. So the satellite shoots this huge like cannon beam thing at the human at this that humongous monster. So the great Parusama makes it to where Negi, Kufa, and Chisame are. Sayo tells them that those at the rendezvous point escaped on another ship. And then the Magia Arabia causes Negi to collapse. We see the great Parusama and another ship flying about. Negi wakes up in a bed and Chisame and Mana come into the room. Mana tells Negi that he has a serious case of acute magical poisoning. Chisame tells them that they still have the diorama sphere that Theodora gave them and suggests to use it. She also tells them that the other students are on another ship driven by a truck driver who is Johnny, uh, Maki and Yuna's like friend. Um, she then tells them that Nadoka said that there's a way to bring everyone back. Uh, Negi speaks with everyone on the other ship. One of them 
being the Doka who relays the information that she received. Uh, the enemy has obtained the code of the life maker and that there are three major categories for the code of the life maker. First is the master key which there are a lot of and used in battle so it's pretty much what those demons are using to like use rewrite. The next is the grand master keys and there are seven of them like that's one that like fate and dynamis is using. And the final one is the great grand master key which may be able to get everyone back who disappeared. Everyone wants to help and rescuing everyone so Negi tells them that he's going into the diorama sphere for medical treatment and to come up with a rescue strategy. He wants everyone to rest up in the sphere when they're ready. <laughs> Excuse me. Negi asks Asuna to go into the diorama sphere with him to talk to her about something. Chisame and Mana overhear the conversation. So in the diorama sphere, Asuna gives Negi a bath. Chisame, Nadoka, and Mana spy on them. Nadia Arabia spreads around Negi's body, and then he asks Asuna if she's the real Asuna. Mana, Chisame, and Nadoka reveal themselves, and they tie Asuna up. Nadoka uses her artifact, that book, on Asuna. I guess it doesn't just get burned. Like, I guess it can come back or something like that. But the book does not reveal that this Asuna is a fake. Mana then shoots her with a gun, but Maggie jumps in the way and gets hit in the shoulder. Maggie then kisses her, and her patio card reveals that she is uh, Shiori, or the card actually says Luna. So she's Luna. Uh, she then reveals her true identity and form. Luna tells them that they captured Princess Asuna and another one of her friends. They are most likely in the Gravekeeper's Palace. Um, so the real Asuna is dressed up um, and she's sitting in captivity. She remembers her past and meeting Nagi to the point when Gato died. Anya comes over to where Asuna is and she snaps back to her normal self. Then Fate comes by with two of his girls. Uh, Asuna attacks Fate but he beats her easily. They explain her goal and that the world is going to be destroyed. They don't know when exactly it will happen. When that happens though, all the living humans um, will be put into the unlivable Martian wilderness. So when the world is destroyed. So they plan to use Asuna's magical power to, to rewrite the magical world and seal it away to save everyone. The rewritten world will be an eternal garden, Cosmo and Telakia. The residents of the magical world are just illusions, and once the magical world disappears, so they will also. So, th that's like the last piece of the puzzle, and it's pretty much what they call an unsolvable problem. So, back with Negi, he tells Mana to keep an eye on Luna. He asks Chisame, Kaede, Chama, and Setsuna to come with them. In the diorama sphere, they open Evangeline's scroll. Evangeline comes out lying naked on the comforter, eating potato chips, and playing retro video games. Evangeline explains that the Magia Rebia will take over his mind and body completely, and they will turn into a monster. Nagi asks for Evangeline, Evangeline's help. She agrees, but it will be the last time that they can use a scroll. She makes the... She kind of forces the Magia Arabia to go berserk inside of Negi. She then tells uh, Kaede and Setsuna to help her contain him. Make, Yuna, Akko, and Akira go inside the diorama sphere. They see an explosion. Evangeline, Kaede, and Setsuna keep fighting uh, Negi. Uh, Yue, back with Yue, and outside of the diorama sphere, Yue and um, Nadoka reunite. Yue reveals that she has most of her memories about Nadoka back. And at the end of the volume, Nadoka tells Beatrix that they'll bring the class rep back. So, thoughts on volume 31, Cosmo and Delikia, one of those false paradises. Yeah, I've seen this in other like stories and whatnot where it's like this, you know, anything you've ever wanted type place, but it's not real, but it, you know, th there's no sadness, no grief, no nothing. Um, 
it's not such a bad place, I guess. It's an eternal garden. Um, I guess it's good that those who disappeared didn't actually die, though. So, you know, they're not dead. Um, and now they, they presented us with the unsolvable problem. And this unsolvable problem is actually pretty interesting because it makes it so that Fate's plans are not so evil after all. Um, he's actually doing something that could be seen as good even because the fact of the matter is there isn't a good solution for this unsolvable problem so fate is working on the one solution that is actually available <laughs> and now it's like hey this world is going to get destroyed he is trying to actually save everyone his methods are questionable but no one has a better idea so, and his idea doesn't involve people getting killed, at, you know, um, or truly killed. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, what he's doing isn't, it, it, you know, it, it's kind of the same thing with Nick and Nagima, like, the thing with, like, Chao Ling Shen, you know, it's like, what, she, what they're doing isn't evil, per se, it's just their methods, the way they go about it is highly dubious and questionable. Uh, Negi's Magia Arabia is just getting worse. Looks like it'll be a while until he gets it taken care of, if he gets it taken care of at all. Got to see uh, Dynamis. He's pretty strong. He's pretty evil. Um, we don't really know much about him, though. Uh, looks like Nadoka though is getting a lot stronger, just much more capable as a, I don't want to say a fighter, but just like, I guess as a fighter actually. Uh, she's definitely one of the more dynamic characters in that she's experienced the most changes within the series. Um, you know, she will begin her counter attack, you know, she actually has powers now. Um... You know, and the escape, you know, was neat. You got characters like Nadoka that got to show off. You got to see uh, Chechamara use her artifact. Um, you know, this escape was filled with peril for the characters, but they managed to get back together. I guess uh, Rock On disappeared in this volume. It's pretty inevitable once Fate had the power of rewrite. Uh, it's admirable that Rock On still continued to fight despite the fact. Uh, the fact that he really had no chance of winning. And I guess that's like kind of like one of the big lessons, you know, that um, he actually tried to teach fate, you know. <laughs> uh, so that was pretty interesting too. So on to volume 32. The volume begins with Akko, Akira, Maki, and Yino walking around the diorama sphere. An explosion happens in front of them and Negi in his berserker form appears for them. He tries to attack Akko, but he suddenly stops in mid-attack. Evangeline then freezes him. The girls then look after Negi while he is bedridden. Chama discusses with the girls to make a patio with Negi. So, at a beach, they'll talk about Negi. Takane and Mei appear, and Takane tells Yuna that her parents are magic teachers. Yuna asks Takane what happened to her mother. Takane reveals that her mother was killed in action in a mission for the government that may be related to their fight right now. Back at Mahora Academy, Akashi Sensei is at his wife's grave, so it's Yuna's dad. Kataragi Sensei goes to meet him. Akashi Sensei gets an emergency call from the headmaster. He wants him to gather all the magic teachers in the school immediately. The world tree is glowing intensely. The only explanation is that something is happening on the other side. The headmaster then gathers all the magic teachers. He explains to them that they've been unable to contact the magical world for two weeks. Uh, the theory that the headmaster is presenting to the teachers is that surviving members of Cosmo and Telekia have gained more credence. And then he reveals that the terrorist's true goal was to gather an enormous amount of magical power. The reason for it is to cre uh, recreate the incident from 20 years ago. The teachers are then assigned different jobs for this issue. 
the headmaster then asks a favor from Aishun, Alberio, and Evangeline. He tells them that Princess Asuna has fallen into enemy hands. Back in England, Ayaka is reading an investigation report on Negi. She then gets a call from uh, Evangeline telling Ayaka that she needs to go back to Japan and that if Negi and Asuna come back, it will be to Japan, not, not to England. Ayaka and the girls leave. Before they leave, Ayaka asks Nakane, uh, Negi's sister, if Nagi, their father, had an interest in astronomy, and specifically Mars. Nakane says she hasn't heard anything about uh, heard about anything like that from Nagi. So back with Negi, him and Evangeline see himself in his mom's form. It's kind of weird. It's like his mind or something, and they're both naked too. <laughs> uh, he wakes up and sees Na Aka looking after him. Outside, Akira asks Negi to make a pack deal with uh, Aka. She reveals to Nagi that Maki has romantic feelings for him. She then reveals that Professor Akashi is a magic teacher. Uh, Akira does not seem to want to make a pack deal with Negi, though. Um, and Negi is just absolutely confused and flustered about all this. <laughs> Negi becomes older, and then he charms Akko, telling her that he came to make a pack deal with her. She puts like the magic candy in her mouth to make him 10 years old again. They then kiss and make a pack deal card. The next day, he fights against Evangeline to help him with that magic at Red Arabia. Afterwards, he talks with Yuna. They kiss and make a pack deal card. Now, next after that, Negi does more training. Makie approaches him. She tells him that she likes him, kisses him, and they make a pack deal card. So the dude is fighting and kissing for like the past three days. <laughs> uh, back with fate, Tsukiyomi catches fate in deep thought. She then attacks him. They fight and Tsukiyomi cuts off his left arm. She says that she'll take the boy for herself, and Fate says that she, he can't let her do that. He then gets serious with her in battle. In a monologue, Fate reveals that his only wish is a fight with Negi. It's back with Negi. Evangeline reveals that he only has six hours left to control the Magia Arabia. Makie, Akka, and Yuna test out their new artifacts. Yuna gets handguns. Makie gets a uh, rhythmic gymnastics ribbon. Akko gets a giant syringe. Negi keeps training with Evangeline. Negi finds out that he had to answer all along and manages to land a uh, good strike on the fake Evangeline. Um, so they also talk too, actually. Um, Negi says like he doesn't mind if he becomes like a monster because his master's like a monster and he loves his master. So Evangeline then asks, what was the answer? Negi responds, I want to be his friend. Which, I'm guessing is, I want to be Fate's friend. So, outside of the diorama sphere, Negi and his group receive a telepathic communication from New Ostia from a beat-up Takamichi and a beat-up Kurt Godel. So, those, those two have been fighting each other, apparently. Godel tells Negi that the situation makes it where he has to cooperate with them. He tells him that the enemy is recreating the events of 20 years ago. The whole magical world has joined forces. So, Megalomacembria, Hellas Empire, Ar Aradne, uh, so all those uh, like kingdoms and whatnot. Godel tells Negi that he'll reach the ruins first and begs him for his help. Or, he wants Negi to reach the ruins first. Negi asks for some time to talk this over with the students. Negi explains the situation to his students. He tells them that their priority is to rescue Anya and get the great Grandmaster Key. They all agreed to help. So, Haruna kind of shows them the situation that they're in right now. The gate port is in the Ostia floating palace ruins. The rapid current of magic is calling, causing the fallen islands to rise again. Anya and, uh, Anya and the enemy leaders are in the Gravekeeper's palace. Once they get what they need, they'll head to the gate port. There's a magical barrier covering everything. Luna, disguised as Asuna, reveals an area where they can slip through it. Negi explains that they'll split into four teams, and one will stay in safe airspace uh, around uh, in Johnny's ship. 
Another will wait at the Great Parusama as an escape vehicle. Another team will rescue Anna, Anya. The last team will get the Great Grandmaster Key. On the Great Parusama, Tsukuyomi attacks the passengers. Negi stops her and they end up on a floating rock. She gives them a message from fate, which is, I'm waiting. Negi tells Johnny and Haruna to take off now without him on the ship. They fly to their destination and a bunch of demons fly after them. Negi says that he'll take care of these demons. Uh, or they're flying to their destination. They're not there yet. So they fight against uh, the demons. Uh, Setsuna decides to fly back to where Negi is. So up ahead, a wall of demons are waiting uh, waiting for those for like Johnny's ship and uh, Harna's ship. Harna asks Godel to take care of them while they rush ahead. Ricardo and Theodora decide to help. So, like, gigantic demons now block the way. Negi and Asun or um, Setsuna appear and stop them. They make it to the Gravekeeper's Palace where fate is waiting for them. So they make a crash landing and Negi, Kaede, Mana, and Setsuna get out and head into the palace. Turns out that Johnny followed them there on the ship too and he crash landed as well. So at the end of the volume, someone approaches them at the entrance and it is Zaize Rainy Day. So thoughts on volume 32. Um, can't really talk about this. Uh, without talking about Zaize Rainy Day. I mean, she has been one of the most mysterious characters <coughs> of the classroom. We know she, I mean, we could always assume she's someone. You know, she's not just any normal student. She most likely had powers. Um, there was hints of it. I mean, she has these little, like, ghost demon things that follow her um so she finally makes an important appearance which is crazy it's volume 32 and they're finally using Zaize. you know what i mean seems like she's a villain though so that's pretty unfortunate she's coming in she's actually dressed in her school clothes we don't know anything about her we don't know her powers or her background um it's gonna be very interesting to see how this turns out but right now she appears to be one of the bad guys so the plan is set and now it's just about the execution of the plan the protagonist will most likely face some obstacles and have some fights on the way you know there's fate there dynamis um you know uh the girl you know fates girls and whatnot also see well with that you know pack deals are being made left and right now so pretty much like all of Ala Alba have powers and artifacts now except for um I think Akira is the only one that doesn't have an artifact um we can we should assume that they'll be in the midst of their own battles too looks like Yuna also got some play in this volume you know, she has these guns now. She's really enthusiastic. She may actually be a useful fighter. You know, there's hints of it during the um, Martians versus Mahora uh, Academy thing. Where she was like, you know, doing really well. And like shooting all the Martians and whatnot. Um, during the Chao Lingshan arc. Uh, looks like, you know, Evangeline's training for Negi to contain that Mad Magia Rebia was really tough. Negi got over it though. He seems to have a handle on the Magia Arabia now. Um, we see a, some more sides of fate. You know, fate Avarunka seems to have something of a human side and actual human emotions. You know, he, he wants to, you know, he says, oh, it's for the mission, it's for the mission. It's like, no, dude, this, this dude just wants to punch Negi in the face. You know, I mean, like, that's what it seems like <laughs> for whatever reason, you know. Also looks like there's some stuff going on on the other side too. Ayaka has her thing. She's investigating Negi. Seems to have uh, more information about everything that's going on than we know. You know, Mahora Academy is getting ready for something big with the magic teachers. 
um, what's going on in the magical world seems to have an effect on what's happening on Earth as well. So, you know, uh, that's it looks like, you know, the headmaster asked Evangeline, Alberio, and Aishun for help too. So, um, don't be surprised to see the people from Earth also um, putting their hands in on what, like, Negi's doing and, like, maybe even saving. Uh, the magical world as well in some way shape or form so that's all for today if you like this don't forget to subscribe share and comment to this channel if you're on youtube or follow share and comment on this channel if you're listening to this on soundcloud if you're listening to this on itunes or stitcher please rate review and share this channel thank you for listening to these manga reviews Next week, I will review volumes 33 through 35 and also read pages um, 5 uh, to 8 of my short story, The Orthodox Clash, next week. So, thank you, and until next time.